Hello and welcome to Mindscapes, our series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy defined contemporary India. My guest today is one of India's most distinguished and experienced bureaucrats. I use the word bureaucrat with a hesitation because he hasn't been your traditional bureaucrat, but has been uh, perceived, recognized and applauded as a man of uh, incisive insight and action. Uh, he has headed and been a part of uh, more government committees and uh, processes of defining uh, areas and solutions uh, to India's predicaments than any other uh, individual that I can immediately identify. Uh, he's been a, a principal secretary to the uh, prime minister. Uh, he's been uh, a member of the uh, a committee that uh, looked at internal security following the Cargill conflict that looked at the, uh, the problems and predicament of the, um, the criminalization of politics and a host of other uh, uh, issues and areas of national importance and concern. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Mr. Enan Wara. Uh, Mr. Wara, you have been a part of uh, so many committees and processes. Uh, at the end of this, uh, do you still have uh, a, a confidence and hope uh, in the processes of committees and, and that the conclusions are acted upon and, and truly make a difference? In the last uh, few years, uh, there is growing uh, evidence that when government of the day sets up a committee or a commission or whatever, they are now more inclined than in the years past to, to, uh, to at least take note of what the committees have generated in terms of the recommendations. Uh, possibly this is due to the fact that uh, governments of the day are more under pressure than in the years past and uh, relatively more concerned than in the years past with some of the issues with which these committees have uh, related to. And uh, therefore I still have hope that as time passes and we look to the future, uh, we shall start seeing uh, better light. Than, than we are inclined to in the normal course of governmental functioning. Mm -hmm. you know, very often, uh, you know, committees uh, are a, or, or commissions are a, are a natural reflex of governments uh, to appease opinion. Something is being done to create the illusion that is being done. You know, when you go into sort of areas of, uh, of, of such important, uh, I know, personal passion for you that looks at the issue of criminalization of politics, that looks at the constitution of India, fundamental uh, aspects that, that impact life here. Uh, how do you keep up your, your, your enthusiasm, your, your motivation, uh, you know, that you obviously bring to committee after committee? You see, the essential uh, motivation, I would say, is, uh, would relate to one's own belief whether uh, what one is getting involved into is likely to produce any result that you just now asked. And how long uh, is that likely to, to, to take if it happens? And uh, what would be the consequence if it doesn't happen? In uh, most of the areas with which I have been concerned, and uh, ironically and circumstantially, they have related to the uh, security arena or governance or administration. I continue to believe that uh, unless we cure our various ills uh, from, from which governance is plagued for the last many years, um, we, we are going to be faced with uh, very grave consequences in the years to come. And uh, it is with that kind of belief and that kind of concern uh, that one agrees to get involved and agrees to keep up to the time schedules and to, to render reports and so on. But I do see your concern and your point that uh, um, governments, yes, on many occasions, if not on most, uh, are perhaps compelled to establish and notify the establishment of one or the other uh, groups or committees or commissions of inquiry uh, when, when they find uh, no other alternative. And that would further prove that if governments uh, uh, were working uh, normally and uh, efficiently and with care and concern in the normal way, in the routine functioning, uh, many of these occasions would not arise. We would not need so many commissions and committees. And also, uh, one must not uh, forget that 
Uh, many good committees and commissions of inquiry were established in the decades past and then ended some excellent uh, outcome which has still not been acted upon. And one hopes and believes, continues to believe that that day would come when, when that would happen, especially in the arena of administrative reform. Uh, we had excellent uh, investigations and recommendations 40 years ago on corruption for that matter. Uh, but uh, I think the, the level of concern and political will uh, which, which is uh, required to, to uh, take such processes forward uh, and uh, achieve the kind of outcome which is uh, envisaged at least in public statements uh, is still not there. And there is a certain amount of progress in this direction, but not enough, not adequate, and not speedy enough. So I, I, I would share with your basic observation that there is a, a dilemma in this. And, uh, but one continues to hope and believe that uh, we are still on the right track. Let's look at the, the issue of, of, of governance and, 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 and corruption uh, and, and the criminalization of politics and that whole sort of uh, nexus. Where is the impetus uh, for change uh, going to come from? Uh, you know, th there are recommendations, but those recommendations needed to be acted upon, in a sense, by the very people uh, whose, whose, whose interests, whose uh, credibility and, and the bona fides, in fact, in a sense, are being questioned. So in, in, in the larger sweep of the change that India so fundamentally needs, where is it going to come from? In the normal course, one would envisage that uh, the cure uh, would generate from within. Now, what is that within? The within would be the political executive, closely followed by the appointed executive, that is the civil services, the bureaucracy, yes, it's especially the higher bureaucracy, the senior bureaucracy. Now, as of today, I cannot say uh, that uh, there is much hope in uh, uh, the remedial path emerging from within, whether from the political uh, circuit, the polity, or from the civil services, the public services, especially in the states. So what does that leave us with? Uh, it leaves us with the hope that as the media mounts pressure in terms of exposures, in terms of, of uh, uh, leakages, if I may use the word, and the social and the activist groups, the NGOs, um, wherever they are functioning, wherever they are located, they go about their business uh, in their own manner and style. But if you see the overall result as between the functioning of the, the civil society and the media especially, uh, I trust you would agree that uh, in the last, let us say, 10 years, uh, majority of the exposures have come from these two sources. And uh, another added factor which, which, which uh, encourages one to, to hope for a better future is that the superior judiciary, uh, while uh, uh, being uh, um, labeled with uh, excessive aggression or, or uh, going out of their constitutional path, uh, they have been um, taking cognizance of some of these matters, even if they do not strictly fall within the ambit of the constitution in terms of the juris jurisdiction of the judiciary. And uh, in uh, public interest litigation cases and similar other uh, cases before the apex court and the higher courts, uh, they have pronounced uh, verdicts, they have given directions which relate to uh, the functioning of the executive. And uh, in the normal sense, uh, it could be argued that they are going well out of their ways, none of their business. For instance, cleaning up um, certain areas of congestion or pollution or cleaning up the waterways or relocating industries or uh, fixing the admission fees of medical colleges. And these are not matters which normally fall within the domain of the judiciary. But willy-nilly, that is what has been happening and that is what has been the order of the day, essentially because uh, the parliament and executive have progressively have been failing to discharge their own constitutional role and responsibility. So I would say that uh, overall uh, the, the cure will commence uh, from a combination of these various factors.
do you sort of genuinely passionately feel, and, and you've just said that it will commence, uh, it, it has only very partially, superficially happened. Uh, we find that even uh, processes of uh, media exposés, that you talk about the interventions of, of, of the court or opinions of the court implied and, 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 and explicit, uh, haven't sufficiently uh, or, or, or in, 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 in any substantial way uh, impacted um, the people we vote for and elect and, and finally hold office. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I'm not certain uh, that, that, that what you're saying is, 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 is what you truly passionately from your heart feel. Well, you see, let us not also forget that uh, in a parliamentary democracy with the kind of electoral process that we have given to ourselves, and the kind which, which really operates in terms of uh, the actual campaigning and the, the process of getting elected, money and muscle power continue to play a very high role. And uh, we talk about criminalization most of the time, day in and day out in parliament, outside parliament, in the media comments. So this is one side of the story that it's, the things are fairly sorted. And uh, the, the election commission reports and the, the parliament reports that uh, of the 4,000 odd uh, members, uh, persons elected to the state legislatures and the 1,000 odd elected to the central parliament, both houses, over 400 had criminal background. Now, one way of looking at it is, uh, why is it that the government of the day cannot uh, promulgate uh, ordinance to deal with the situation in a swift, speedy, efficient manner? And why does it not happen? Now, why it doesn't happen is because of the nature of our politics, the way our democracy runs. In most states uh, today and uh, in the parliament since uh, 1996, central parliament, we have seen coalition governments. If the parliament has over 40 political parties and the cabinet has over 20, um, I dare say it is uh, not an easy path for the prime minister, whoever he may be, to, to, to muster courage and one day say, look, this is the way I'm going. And that is why for the last 30 years, the Lokpal bill has been uh, pushed around, uh, referred to this committee or that committee. But uh, now, of late, one, one, one hears that uh, it is ultimately going to be presented to the parliament and, and the prime minister and his cabinet colleagues uh, would be covered uh, within the ambit of this uh, the proposed legislation. So there are problems in terms of uh, what else could be done and who would do it. And now the normal and the, the correct way of doing things is within the constitution, the organs of the constitution. The organs of the constitution, that is the parliament, the executive, uh, especially the parliament and executive, are not able to perform their designated role, their constitutional role. And judiciary plays a certain kind of role to, to fill up the gaps, at least in the short run. Um, then the only other uh, possibilities for the people to rise and, and uh, do what is necessary. Now in a country of one billion, uh, you see the dimension, the scale of our, our problems, um, language, culture, caste, community, poverty, illiteracy, uh, so one can't uh, visualize a situation emerging in the short run where enough public pressure will build up which will compel uh, the politicians and the political parties to, to, to perform better, to be more honest, to deliver governance. Uh, it is not happening at least for the moment. But hopefully, again I would say thanks to the media, the electronic media which is sort of simultaneous, which is real time, and which is understood by the people, even those who are illiterate. And they can see a visual and they can hear what is being said in their own language. The level of awareness is increasing and the, uh, the level of uh, um, disappointment, if I may use the word, frustration and even despair on occasion is mounting. And this would act as another factor and hope, I hope that it doesn't get out of hand, this factor, because that would lead to chaos. That would lead to, to, to assault on the establishment. And if you have a situation where the establishment is assaulted in a physical way, if there is looting, burning, and uh, arson, and uh, mayhem, uh, then you have uh, civil strife of a nature, which, which will become another problem. But yet, if you, if you uh, again remind yourself that uh, we are a parliamentary democracy, that one of the 
most outstanding achievements uh, post independence is the fact that democracy has come to stay in our country. Uh, so we are paying the price of, of that uh, great achievement. In you the mentioned the, uh, the, the, the constitution uh, review process. Um, how actively and how vigorously uh, is that process uh, in fact uh, underway? Is this just uh, uh, a, a process that's been, in, uh, that's been initiated and, and how active is, is, is the committee? How often is it meeting? When do you think it will deliver results? Uh, will it be as efficient and as on time as, as, as commissions and committees that you have yourself led? Well, I, I, what, I, what I would say is that uh, by all accounts, by recent reports, uh, the commission is uh, proceeding with this work. It may ask for a short extension. I would know for sure. But it has set up a dozen more panels which are which have been functioning, which have rendered interim reports, which have been made public for, for discussion and debate. Here again, uh, I would like to remind you that when it was set up, uh, there was a lot of political uh, reaction. And uh, the opposition parties assaulted the government for having s even thought about such a commission. Now, I don't think uh, that most of this criticism came from uh, well-informed sources or concern. It was a talking point. It was to assault the government anyhow, because uh, if you are in opposition, then you have to oppose. Uh, so the concern was not there. And uh, ultimately, the government had to clarify, and the chairman of the commission himself had to make a public statement that he is not concerned with uh, amendment to the, he is looking at the functioning of the constitution since its adoption and uh, uh, suggest ways and means of uh, making the system uh, more workable. What kind of uh, 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 problems that you, that you, that you hope uh, it will address and what kind of solutions you see? Well, two of the main areas with which I have been, in which I have been interested and in, uh, with one of which I was partly concerned and involved at least in the initial phases, one uh, relates to the reform of the electoral uh, system. And the other relates to the functioning of, of, of governments in terms of larger sense governance. And as you've seen over a period of time, we have blunted some of the instrumentalities of the constitution. Like if the constitutional functioning fails in a particular part of the country in a given state, uh, the center is no longer in a position, thanks to various circumstances, to impose governor's rule or to impose unitary um, administration because of the Supreme Court rulings, because of the manner in which we have gone about using uh, this constitutional provision in the years past in a totally political manner. So we have in fact uh, uh, blunted some of the instrumentalities which were available to us. Uh, we have to now start walking in the direction of restoring the normalcy of functioning uh, in the way it was uh, structured and envisaged, and which hasn't happened. What about your concerns on the electoral system? Electoral system, I think we have to concern ourselves, uh, A, with, with uh, what needs to be done to, to uh, I wouldn't use the word stop, but to discourage the proliferation of political parties, one-man party, half-man party, you know. And we have regional parties, we have sub-regional parties, we have state-level parties, we have district-level parties, and all of them get registered in the seek recognition of the election commission. And so the, we have to, first of all, stop that happening. That would hopefully lead to a process of mergers, liquidations, to, to you know, regroupings and so on. And hopefully moving the direction of two to three party situation in the years to come. And the second is the, the very process of the electoral process. Uh, if you wish to stand for elections or I wish to stand for elections, what are the, what are the constraints? First of all is the enormous monetary constraint, you see. Where do you get the couple of crores that you need to get to the parliament? And how do you mobilize that? And uh, what kind of agents would you be able to secure who would volunteer to work for you when you are not a known politician uh, for the last 20 years or 30 years and you have no money? So we have to start step by step eliminating those processes or making uh, it more difficult for uh, mere financial resources and uh, threats and muscle power to, to determine a man's entry into the legislature. You referred earlier in our conversation uh, to the Northeast. You've been uh, actively involved in formulating policy and strategies and uh, issues of internal security, Kashmir, and, and, and I, was, I was just referring uh, uh, to the Northeast. Uh, and let's just maybe briefly look, look at the Northeast. Uh, we tend to uh, club all of the Northeast together as, as uh, 
Uh, you know, there, there, there was a tendency in the north to club everything in the south as being Madrasi uh, in some ways. Uh, the northeast, you know, each, each region has um, uh, individual specific uh, nuanced issues and problems and predicaments. Uh, is, 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 there an, is there a risk? How much of a risk is there? that uh, it, the same myopic vision, in a sense, that we applied uh, to Kashmir uh, is, is, is what we're doing to the specific issues and concerns uh, in the Northeast. Well, one, of the, uh, one of the major problems of the Northeast is that it is distant from Delhi. Secondly, the, we haven't done enough over the last uh, 50 years to develop adequate transport and uh, communication facilities. So it kind of remains cut off, you know. And the people of these uh, seven states in the Northeast, uh, all of them now sovereign states in their own right and the Constitution, they were earlier only hill districts and uh, uh, governed under NIFA, the Northeast Frontier Agency, and Assam was the only state. Now, each of these uh, tribal communities or erstwhile hill districts are uh, states in their own right. Not very large populations, so the whole of Northeast is a small population. Uh, they feel alienated uh, for a variety of reasons. So, because we, we have uh, inclined and uh, tended to, to, to uh, send out communications and policy frameworks sitting in Delhi without adequate knowledge of uh, the uh, individual tribal communities and the, the very large number of tribal communities uh, who, who comprise Northeast. So Mizoram is quite distinct from Manipur and Manipur is totally different from Nagaland and Nagaland is different from Arunachal. Unfortunately, another factor which has come in the way of the Northeast being able to get rid of its problems is the fact that the, the quality of political leadership of the Northeast has been no different from other parts of the country. Their own leaders, the tribal leaders. And levels of corruption are also uh, very frightening. And the, the levels of complicity, the collusions between the political leaderships and the public services uh, on the one side and uh, insurgent elements and anti-national elements and criminal elements on the other side and the whole thing is uh, seriously complicated by the fact that uh, almost the entire Northeast are border states. We have a vast border with the Myanmar, we have a very large border with the Bangladesh, uh, we have a border with China, and uh, states like, let's say, Tripura, 90% uh, of the boundary is, uh, is a foreign country. So how significant is, is, is the foreign hand? I would say that uh, most of the problems are our own. They are internal, they are domestic, and they have been complicated by the external factor. And uh, especially in some of the northeastern states where the external adversary intelligence agencies have been playing a very proactive role in fermenting problems. I'm going to move you quickly, Kashmir, because uh, uh, the time is short. You have been uh, extensively um, involved, associated uh, with the issues there. Uh, we, we record this almost sort of during the, the postscript, as it were, uh, to the um, Agra uh, summit. Um, if you were to predict a solution, if you were to predict a future 10, 15, 20 years uh, from now, or if, if, if you feel there is a, a possibility in, in, in a shorter time frame, uh, a solution that would be enduring, complete, and lasting. What, what, what would your dream, your, your vision be? Well, you see, Kashmir uh, from day one has been complicated. And uh, Pakistan, rightly, wrongly, fortunately or unfortunately, have made it a one-point agenda, which has complicated life. And uh, their level of interference, which continues unabated, has become more and more intense and more and more telling. On our side, I think we have failed and failed uh, quite visibly in uh, not timely, uh, fully understanding and appreciating the internal dynamics uh, of the state, especially uh, those which operate in the valley. And we have seen the proliferation of, of certain influences, factors, elements, uh, who are least concerned with the future of uh, the state, especially so of the valley, but who have been funded or, or um, encouraged to, to, to proceed on certain lines which are uh, 
highly injurious to, to national interests, highly injurious to the state interest, and highly injurious to the interest of the valley. Now, all this uh, is uh, going into history, but I would say in response to what you have said that uh, my own vision is that if we can uh, persuade, educate, bring around uh, our neighbor uh, to, to be a little more reasonable in, in visualizing this entire problem and trying to see how it can get resolved, then um, one of the things which, which need to be done on our side, beside whatever else which needs to be done bilaterally between the two countries, is uh, to ensure the, the safety and security of the people of uh, the state and this enormous uh, and frightening levels of killing which go on day in day out, those will have to be brought into control. Now, part of it is domestic, part of it is uh, the creation of external factors. So whatever that takes uh, into ensuring that stops happening or gets, starts getting reduced, and then looking at the, the socio-economic development of the far-flung communities, the Gujars, the, the Bakarwals, the, the, the Muslim communities in, in the valley, the non-Muslim communities, the Kashmiri Brahmins who are never talked about, never uh, discussed at all their problems, who are refugees in their own homeland. So we would have to do a great deal to, to, to restore normalcy, to restore peace and amity, and a great deal of this effort would not relate merely to the deployment of security forces. Do you see this as achievable, tangible, possible in the foreseeable future? I think that or is this have, a work in progress that will continue for a very, very long time? Well, as of now, one could say that it's work in progress which will continue. But my own belief is that if we devote ourselves uh, systematically in a planned manner with a certain vision and imagination, it is a doable task. It is something which we can achieve. And with the people of Kashmir, through its leadership and uh, in a bipartisan manner and not in a political, uh, with a political focus all the time, uh, thinking of the next round of elections and what result that would generate and so on. So we have to carry the leadership along and through the leadership the people along and side by side deal with the, uh, the external factors which are uh, indeed uh, 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 very worrying, and uh, they haven't eased or ceased in the last 10, 11 years. Mr. Bora, thank you very much. This has been a great privilege. Thank you, sir.